Hi, guys. Hey. Good to see you again. What up, Kara? How you doing? I'm great. Good. Good. So this is technology entrepreneur. I'm reading the headline here. It's technology entrepreneurship as a force for social progress. Um, when you guys met, how long ago? We all met 20 Over years 20 ago, Over 20 years correct? ago, 20 yeah. Years. So Steve backstage was telling me a story when you were trying to buy his company, right? Well, he was trying to sell his company. Right. We didn't yeah. consider buying it. He ended up selling it to Yahoo for $6 billion, and we thought that was a little, little high. Of course, we were not one. It was to, a bargain. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so I think at the time we were worth, I don't know, maybe $100 billion or so. I know I'm not one to talk, but thought it was a little pricey. But he was smart. He, you know, the, the Yahoo deal, and then kind of called his stock and made a bunch of money and bought yep. a team and then became Mr. Shark Tank. So it's, it's a, great, yeah. uh, a great entrepreneurial run. And now he's celebrating entrepreneurs from all over the country, which is so awesome. So let's talk about that. So one of the, you guys started off with your businesses as they were in early internet. That's where you made a lot of your money. Um, and you, you all made the money, but then you shifted quite a bit in your careers. And one of the things, Steve, you've done is moved on to the idea, and I know you, you did this with me three years ago. We started talking right. about this idea about the next internet has to be made up of social entrepreneurship. It has to be regulated. They have to be thinking about bigger social issues, and we have to find talent elsewhere because we're on a downward spiral of innovation. So talk a little bit about what you've been doing and where you are right now. Well, there's really two themes that uh, kind of drive what I'm doing now. One is what I've called, which goes back to what you're saying, the third wave of the internet. You know, we all were part of the first wave getting everybody online when we started AOL in 1985 only 3% of people were online, and they're online one hour a week. Mm -hmm. It was kind of early days, and you know, that whole first 20 years was just getting everybody connected, the on-ramps, the servers, and everything. That set the stage for the second way, which has been mostly about software and apps riding on top of the internet, mostly on top of smartphones, Facebook, Google, et cetera. Mm -hmm. And the third wave is really integrating the internet in a much more seamless ways throughout our lives, changing how we think about healthcare, and food and agriculture, and smart cities. But it does require a different mindset, I believe. Partnerships are way more important. Policy, regulatory issues are, are way more important. These are regulated uh, uh, sectors. And a second idea is this rise of the rest idea. How do we make sure entrepreneurship is happening everywhere in the country and entrepreneurs everywhere are getting backed? And Mark does a lot of this as well. Last year, for the investors out there, I guess all of you, 75% of venture capital in this country went to just three states. Mm -hmm. California, New York, and Mass. Seventy-five percent. So the other Most forty-seven is states. Right? Is that correct? California gets more than fifty percent alone. You know, right. New York and Massachusetts are you know eleven, twelve percent. Uh, so Ohio, less than one percent. Virginia, less than one percent. Michigan, less than one percent. Last week I was in Florida as part of our Rise Rest tour. Third largest state, one point three percent. Texas, everything's bigger in Texas, a little bit bigger, less than 2%. Mm -hmm. So the reality is most of the money is back in the entrepreneurs in places like Silicon Valley, not in many parts of the country. And since startups create most of the jobs, that's a problem. It's also a great, I think, investment arbitrage because most of the capital's in one place, not surprisingly, supply demand. You all know the dynamics, valuations there tend to be higher. And in most parts of the country, okay. they tend to be lower. So it's, a, I think, a big opportunity. To, you know, the third wave and the rise of rest, I think, will so that's converge. The, that's the dream is to find these big companies, but they do tend to coalesce. Mark, but you weren't. You were unusual. You were you were one of the few, as I recall, that was anywhere else. I didn't have to travel very far, nope. and I remember Mark Andreessen wouldn't leave the Hobies in in uh, <laughs> on in Palo Alto. I think that's he went maybe between his house and Hobies, but they didn't want to go anywhere, and they wanted to stay within the Stanford sure. corridor essentially. So talk a little bit about this because it's always been the idea that this was going to happen, that there was going to be Silicon Holler and Silicon this. And, does, has not happened. But Scooter said it best last, you know, when you were talking to him last, if you're on a mission and you're driven, it doesn't matter where you are. Mm -hmm. And effectively, you know, tech has become the industry in Silicon Valley, like the movie industry in Los Angeles. And it, that creates its own set of problems. I didn't have to deal with the politics. I didn't have to deal with looking over somebody's shoulder for the next big deal, hiring somebody, you know, to be an administrator who said, I'm only there while, till I get my startup funded, right? People can, in Dallas, people come to work. Mm -hmm. Right, and we get the job done, and so it really didn't matter. And and the whole promise of the internet, you know, back in the mid '90s was you connect everybody anywhere. Mm -hmm. And so it never even dawned on me that I should be in Silicon Valley or to move. And in fact, it was so much more friction-free being in Dallas; it made it a lot easier. 
Well, also, you, just a little history lesson, Ms. Swisher. Thank you. Uh, the first wave of the internet yeah, was, was super distributed. Yeah. Uh, Mark was in, in Texas. Sprint was in Kansas City. Hayes, the big modem company, was in Atlanta. Compus the online service was in Columbus, Ohio. Prodigy was in White Plains, uh, New York. IBM's PC operations were in Boca Raton. We were outside of Washington, D.C. Microsoft actually started in Albuquerque, right. then moved to right. Seattle. I could give you a dozen other examples. And, and if you go before that even, remember, there was Wang and Digital, yeah. right. you Which know, was, and there's the quarter 128. That yeah, was the 128 outside of Boston, right? right. And so, H, all you had in Silicon Valley back in the early days of PCs and networking was HP, mm -hmm. you know, and Apple. So, but it still is, if you the 50% of the venture capital money goes there, what, how do you shift that out? I mean, how, it, it didn't happen that way. It coalesced in one place. Oh, no, it continues. coalesced in the second way when it became about software. It, mm -hmm. you know, Silicon Valley rose to, rose to prominence, arguably dominance. But my point is the first wave, that was not the case. The third wave, I do not believe it will be the case. The reason for that is a lot of the domain expertise that's going to be critical in the third wave, the partnerships that are going to be critical in the third wave, are in the middle of the country. Healthcare, for example, sure, it's, you know, Stanford does some awesome things, but you know, MD Anderson in Texas, Cleveland Clinic in Ohio, Mayo in, in Minnesota, Johns Hopkins in, in, uh, in Maryland, Baltimore, those are the centers of excellence. The big healthcare plans are United Health in, in, uh, in uh, Minnesota, you know, a bunch of companies in, in Nashville, uh, in farming, ag tech, you know, the big companies are like Monsanto headquartered in St. Louis, Louisville, uh, uh, Lincoln, Nebraska. That's where the expertise is. So there's an opportunity because that domain expertise is going to matter more. Partnerships are going to matter more to, to build up these, these sectors in these, in these cities. But it's not going to happen if all the money is somewhere else. As a result, we've seen in the last several decades, I'm sure it's true with you know, people here, or pe family members, been a massive brain drain. The people who grew up in a lot of these places left because the money was there, the opportunity was there. But it's, changed. it's a lot different now. I think, look, in terms of capital invested, yes, the percentages are, are absolutely correct. But in terms of number of businesses started, mm -hmm. it's shifting dramatically. Somewhere because, else. Yeah, because over the last 10 years, you, don't, you, know, you need a laptop and a connection, you know, a broadband connection, which is more prevalent, and you know, a cloud account. Mm -hmm. whether it's AWS or whatever. And now with AI, it's even more so. You know, when you're in those concentrated areas, you're competing for resources, whereas, you know, AI isn't based in Silicon Valley. You know, the best, the best technologists are coming out of Montreal, Boston, Pittsburgh, Austin, you know, Silicon Valley can be their own little world, and it's an open opportunity for us. Yeah, I'll give you three examples okay. from last week, because we were in, did a Rise Rest tour in, in, in Florida. In Orlando, amazing things happening around interactive entertainment. Obviously, Disney's there, but also Electronic Arts has 1,000 people there. The university created a program around interactive entertainment, booming. Space Coast, 50 years ago, it inspired us all with Apollo 11. There's a ton of space tech startups in that, in that Space Coast area. Uh, and finally, in, in, in Miami, uh, Chewy was an e-commerce company acquired for $3 billion, 10,000 employees outside of Miami. Magic Leap, one of the most interesting technology companies out there. They've raised over $2 billion dollars, have 1,700 employees. The jury's still employees. out on that one, though. Seven, what's that? <laughs> the jury's still out on that one. The jury's still out, but the jury's yeah. all on, on everything. You, when well, you started covering us, more out people on that didn't one think we were going to the reason. You got assigned it because nobody else in the Washington Post wanted to cover it. Nobody <laughs> believed in the internet. Stuff happened. But the I point is out, that 17... Let me just say, I drove out to Vienna, Virginia, and nobody else did, but keep I, going. Yeah, that's, yeah, that was you know, the rise of rest. Thank right. you for supporting it. My point about Magic Leap is... 1,700 people, mostly in Plantation, Florida, 45 minutes north of Miami. Hundreds of top quality uh, engineers have been recruited, left Silicon Valley to go there because they believed that was the opportunity, and they got well funded. Mm -hmm. So, and, and we just saw in the last year, Duo Security got acquired in Ann Arbor for $3 billion. Qualtrics in Salt Lake City got acquired for $8 billion. There are examples of this happening, but people are not paying attention. Investors are missing out on this, uh, what I think is one of the great Two, Arbitrage. two questions, Mark. You said, why are investors not paying attention to this? And two, one of the thing, one of the statistics I just saw is startup startups are at the, its lowest point mm. in 30 years now. Is that correct? So two different questions, right? Right. So I think investors are, and investors are investing more locally mm -hmm. because you can't miss it. I mean, every decent-sized city has a variety of universities and STEM, and there's there's a variety of opportunities there, and it's cheap. You know, for, for particularly for a tech startup, you know, even a healthcare startup, it costs next to nothing. So I don't think they have to go out and make the rounds for VCs. In terms of startups, I think there's a, there, for up until the mid-90s, you know, 
you had barber shops was a startup, yeah. right? You had you know labor, different types of labor. Those types of startups have diminished dramatically because people aren't coming out of school learning trades and just rolling out and starting a company. If you pull that out, I don't, I don't, I haven't seen any shortage of startups. I haven't seen any shortage of, of people wanting to start companies. We're not having, you know, we have thousands, fifty thousand plus people try out for Shark Tank every year. So I think it, if you looked at different categories of startups, maybe you'll see some some categories really falling back, particularly trades driven ones. But I think technological. Where, where are they then? If you, you what, well, let's start first. How do you get? You have 50,000 applying, so you think there's no shortage of startups anywhere in the country. What about you? No. Well, startups are down. Yeah. That, is, that is the data. But there's also an ethos that leads more people, particularly younger people, to want to start companies. They often feel like they have to leave where they are to go to someplace else. Yeah. And the answer to your earlier question about why the investors focused on that, uh, it's not insane that basically investors, you know, like pattern recognition, they do more in the future of what's worked in the past. In the last 10 years, the best performing Venture funds in Silicon Valley have mostly invested in Silicon Valley, so let's do more of it. That doesn't mean it's going to change, but they're, 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 people are just doing more of the same. Venture capitalists, it's convenient. They like to, you know, have, you have to get on a plane to go to some other places. They would rather get in their car. Some would rather, you know, bike to the company. But I think the disconnect, VCs aren't the greatest source of capital. Right. Greece, VCs chase you know, growing companies, they want to put last money in, right? They want to be in Lyft and Uber right before they go public because they can make, create puts and play all kinds of games and say they're in unicorns. The reality is, you know, the companies I get that I've invested in, 5,000, 10,000, 50,000, 500,000, a million, whatever it is, they're everywhere but Silicon Valley and they're my best companies. Uh, to me, I, if somebody comes to me from Silicon Valley, their opportunity is minimal. Mm -hmm. Because to me, it tells me that they're not recognized. The rents are higher, the employees are higher. They're not in it for the right reason. That they'd be anywhere else if they were. I, I'm seeing no shortage of opportunities, no shortage of investments. Other people I know, investors, no shortage, and the returns are great. Mm -hmm. You know, but it, VCs just play it completely different. PE plays it completely different. Angel and seed. Whew, Mm -hmm. I don't see any. And the other, the other piece of it is, and, and Jim Breyer, who's I know here, yeah. is one of the investors in the Riser S Fund. We have 40 individuals: Jeff Bezos, Howard Schultz, Ray Dalio, mm -hmm. David Rubenstein, you know, you know uh, Jim, uh, John Doerr, you know, people like that. Great, great group of folks. Uh, Jim Breyer told us when we were talking about this that because of his success backing Facebook and Excel and now Breyer Capital. He kind of knows everybody in Silicon Valley. Mm -hmm. And because of what he's done in China, he kind of knows a lot of things in China. He doesn't really have a network in most parts of the country, both to source deals and then to create the, you know, the support mechanism around these companies. So that's another reason why they don't do it. But just because they don't do it, doesn't mean they will do it. And in the future, I think more and more people will pay attention to this. More and more we'll see there's outsized investment opportunities because when these companies go public, mm -hmm. nobody says, oh, it's in, it's in Columbus, Ohio, there should be a discount, but at that venture stage, there absolutely is a discount because right. of the supply-demand imbalance. That will close over the next 20 years. You know, we're just trying to figure out ways to accelerate it. So let's wait, 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 wait. How many accelerators are there now in every, every city. single right. city? Right, yeah. There's no, you don't hear stories about accelerators closing every other minute, right? They're popping up everywhere for every group, for every vertical. I mean, they're, they're just nonstop. And that tells you, right, it, all the accelerators aren't based in Silicon Valley. Right. They're everywhere uh, else. Yeah. Nashville to Tyler, Texas to, you know, Dubuque, Iowa, they all have accelerators. And there, there's business competitions everywhere. Every college has got an entrepreneurship group right now. Mm -hmm. You know, and so there's kids coming out of every community college. There's, there's no shortage. I think we're measuring wrong when we say that there's fewer companies being started, that there's no capital going outside of Silicon Valley. The biggest deals by far, right. no question, right? But I, I just, all this talk about, you know, yeah, the decline of entrepreneurship, bullshit, right? Bullshit. I mean, it's not even close. It's so cheap. You can start anything, anywhere, anytime. So there, there, is, there is a problem, though, several problems, just to All be right. I want to talk about what, what, what are the challenges? I was going to tell you. I'm pretty mm -hmm. bullish on this. Here, challenge one is the capital, which leads people to leave. Challenge number two is this talent issue, where there has some of the best people in the, you know, we were at uh, Silicon Valley, uh, Speaking of the TechCrunch conference, maybe 2,000 people in the room. I asked for a show of hands how many people were from the greater San Francisco Bay Area. 
less than 10%. Essentially, everybody in Silicon Valley is some, from someplace yes. else. As a result, because they left, they're less likely to start companies there. And as the companies succeed, they don't necessarily have the talent to help scale it. So right. you've got to address the capital issue. Then you have to address the, you know, the, the talent, the talent issue. Again, and you also need to create more of a fearlessness in some of these communities. There are a lot of parts of the country that are a little cautious, are a little risk averse. One of the great things about Silicon Valley is this anything is possible, you know, change the world, you know, kind which is, of. A, which is the not great thing about Sometimes Silicon. it's to an extreme, but, but right. having a little more of that kind of uh, that's, see, confidence. That's definitely you have to deal with scale. Right? So if you run a fund, you have to hit numbers, right? And, and you guys do amazing things. And you're, I think you're smarter than 99% of them out there because you're going places where other people aren't. But the reality of technology right now is AI is changing everything. Right. Right. And so what does it take to learn AI? So I sit there, I do my machine learning tutorials. I do my neural network tutorials. And so I understand it. And there's a lot of bullshit, more bullshit coming from Silicon Valley. But any kid right, can take that, make that effort and learn how to create a neural network, get onto AWS, get a $100,000 credit, go through their school and get it. There is no shortage of opportunity. It takes brains, right. it takes effort. It's like Scooter said, you got to break through barriers and just do what it takes. But there's no barriers anymore all right, at but there, all. I think he's correct in the, in the, the amount of talent around you in, co in collecting. No, not for you an AI-generated so. world. No, not at all. Because? Because you need, ver in an AI world where you're building, you need domain expertise. And domain expertise comes from everywhere. So if I'm building a machine learning tool, and probably half the people here have dealt with machine learning or neural networks, they need people who understand the vertical that they're approaching. That's not the type of expertise that Silicon Valley has. You don't have people who are experts in real estate just moving to, to Silicon Valley to be an expert in real estate. They're all around the world. If you want um, medical expertise, you go to UPMC in Pittsburgh, right? Or, you know, there's just oil and gas, you get it out of Texas. And all these vertical applications, just like back in the day, we used, you know, we wrote software for different verticals and applied it. Then we put it on a network. Then we put it on the net. Then we integrated mobile. You, if you have vertical expertise and you're willing to sit down and scrub through AI, learn how to use data, and how data is becoming so much more valuable, Silicon Valley certainly doesn't have any type of monopoly on data. Mm -hmm. Now, we can talk Facebook and all those other things, and but in Google. terms of startups. But the talent issue, though, does get more difficult uh, as these companies do scale. They're going from 10 people to 50 people or 100 people. Well, that's the same okay. for any type of company. When you're going to 1,000 people or 2,000 people, it is a, an issue, which is why you have to slow the brain drain and create this boomerang of talent. But what Mark is saying around the, this domain expertise and builds on my third wave comments is, is incredibly important. And again, this is where Silicon Valley might get, might get trapped in its own dogma. The, the, the belief, as you know, in Silicon Valley is essentially Ignorance is a competitive advantage. Yes. Naivete yes. is a competitive advantage. And yes. examples like PayPal, it's, it's famously said, the reason they were successful is they knew nothing about the credit card industry, therefore brought fresh insights that led to PayPal. That is true, I grant yes. them that. But knowing nothing about healthcare is not going to you know, give you the partnerships right, you need, right. not going to give you, the, you know, the, the ability to deal with some of the regulatory issues. You actually yeah. do need to know something yeah. about healthcare. You actually do need I to had know a, something about I had about a Silicon farming. Valley person tell me a couple of years ago that building cars was trivial. And I, I, I hit them. Um, but the, the concept of it, I was like, it's not yeah. trivial. No, it's easy. Okay. Everything else is hard. And I said, no, actually, manufacturing something is hard. So it was, kind of, it was a discussion about where autonomous cars right. are going. This was not Elon Musk. He does not <laughs> think it's trivial, um, obviously. He definitely doesn't think it he now. He definitely doesn't think it now, absolutely. Um, so when you think about what you need then throughout our country to create, I want to get to social progress by the end, but to create great entrepreneurs. Now you do it on your show and it's that show busy kind of thing with the stuff like that. But I want to talk about what the essential elements of entrepreneurship now need to be um, and what we need in this country to have to create that through the education system. But what do you think the key parts going forward to the next era are for entrepreneurs? Because they, they change over time. I mean, I think we need to start educating our you know, the reason I do Shark Tank is just sends the message that if someone walking on the stage can do it, you can be anywhere and do the same thing. You know, being an entrepreneur is just taking a step, you know, having that idea, having that willingness, and then just taking the next step and just doing it. And, you know, I think 
It's just a matter of encouraging it. It's, it's not like it's some special God-given talent that entrepreneurs have. Well, they sell it like that. There's, there's, there's an ethos around it that there's, they're special in some fashion. Yeah, maybe once you get there, some people like to brag and talk that way. But look, we all that have kids, when, our, when my nine-year-old comes back and sells you know, a little bracelet that, that he made, or my daughter puts something together and sells it, or someone that has a lemonade stand, yes, right? What special talent is that? You know, it's just a parent encouraging and letting people know. Now, when we say entrepreneurship is dying, socialism is coming, yada, 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 I mean, that's self-defeating. But Shark Tank, I think, is, has been terrific in, in educating people about what startups are and entrepreneurship were. When I was growing up, it was, those were not common concepts. Even when I graduated from college, it wasn't like a startup ecosystem. There wasn't much venture capital, yeah, certainly not companies. backing 21-year-olds. So, right. you know, just creating that sense of uh, possibility is super important. But going back to your question around, uh, around how we kind of train them. And this K-12 is obviously broken. And one of the areas we need to focus on is the skills for the future, to, for the jobs of the future. And some of that coding is important for people who have that aptitude, but not everybody should be a coder. The other one, the other C's that I think will define this third wave, creativity, collaboration, communication skills, those things are super important and are going to be the difference between make, and, make or break. You just have to be good. In an AI world, you have to be knowledgeable about something. Right, because a specific thing. Right, like you have to have some domain knowledge kit. because the whole idea of building a neural network is identifying what's going to feed what, right, and what's the outcome that you want, and knowing what is right, what is wrong, and where biases are, and being able to test for it. It's not the programmers because AI is going to, you know, 20 years from now, if you're a coder, you might be out of a job, right, because right? it's just math. And so, whatever you we're defining, the AI to do, somebody's got to know the topic. If you're doing an AI to emulate Shakespeare, somebody better know Shakespeare, right. mm -hmm. you know? And that is a key component. So I think a liberal arts major is just as important in the future as a coding major. Now, the coding major who graduates this year probably has better short-term um, um, opportunity than the liberal arts major that's a Shakespeare expert, but long-term, you know, it could be, t it's like people who learned COBOL or Fortran and thought that was the future and they were going to be covered forever. Right. The value is going to diminish over time. So how do you bring that into the educational system? Because a lot of it's been focused on code, like let's code, let's code. Cause, and I've always thought that's going to be replaced, like eventually, like you were so saying. So go to markcubanai.org. Okay. Literally, we did for um, some disadvantaged schools in Dallas, Microsoft and I and a couple other groups, we got together and started teaching kids using spreadsheets how to do machine learning and how easy it is. So if you, here's the set of data, and this is, you know, if flowers all have these certain um, identifiable aspects, what's the next one, the probability of what the next type of flower is going to be? And it's easy to learn, right? Someone's just got to do it. And we're not alone. I mean, where I grew up in Pittsburgh, there's Montour High School mm -hmm. that is doing the same type of things. And because it's like when we were, we were getting started, PCs were so hard. Getting on the network, you had to have a TCPI client, a modem, right? It was so hard. AI is going to be second nature going forward. But if you make it comfortable for people now, that's where the innovation and the entrepreneurs come from because they see things that are difficult to other people and they think it's second nature, just like apps. Apps used to be a big deal. Yeah. Now no one even thinks so about is it. Is there enough push by the government to push the, the, these things? So the government was a partner in this for many years, this idea, or maybe they weren't. How do you, where, No, I think there have been a number of things that President Obama asked me to uh, chair something called Startup America eight or nine years ago, and uh, the President Trump, he, we talked about it earlier today, I was a big fan and still am of opportunity zones that create incentives to get more capital, more people in, in, in more places. So there is a role uh, at the federal government, obviously there's a role at the, you know, the state and local government to kind of set the, set the table, set the stage, but ultimately it comes down to entrepreneurs. It comes down to entrepreneurs with ideas we just collectively need to make sure we're lifting up but entrepreneurs everywhere, funding entrepreneurs everywhere, and helping to scale these, these, these companies. But the biggest issue for entrepreneurs, for capitalists, for those of us who are successful, is if someone's only going to be paid by the hour, they're only going to be paid by the hour, and they're always going to fall behind, and income distribution is, the disparity is going to get wider and wider. We as entrepreneurs have got to make a point to give stock to everybody that works for us period, end of story, no exceptions, because that's the only way people are going to get any type of equity appreciation. Otherwise, it's, it's part two to that, it's our responsibility, right? Capitalism isn't bad. It's when capitalists don't pay attention. 
It's like running a business. Our country is a lot like running a business. That, you know, some people might not like to say that, but you can't just look at the short term in the immediate aspect. You've got to look at the long term. And if we don't start recognizing that the more disadvantaged people become, the greater the disparity, we're at risk at social unrest. Because when social unrest, you get a Ferguson, ask what happened to the businesses in Ferguson, right? Mm -hmm. right? They get torched, right? And, and the greater the disparity, the more people rebel. And so it's our responsibility. And what I try to do with my Shark Tank companies is in terms of a diversity, here's why it makes sense. Here's why you hire people of color. They do things and understand and have a perspective you don't have. Here's why you want all your employees why, to have stock. Why, why is that so difficult in terms of share? I mean, like, look, Uber is going public. The drivers are striking Uber and Lyft today because they don't have pieces of it. Now, I know it's complex. I've heard the, I've heard the speeches from both CEOs on why they it's can't. It's not complex. Not that well, AOL, we had, every employee had stock. Right. So, so we had the For example, the drivers, some are part-time, some are not part-time. It's are, trickier with, with a kind of a, a workforce the, in, like that. that in the that, workforce that, like that. That's true. Would that be something you would say, like drivers who contributed to Uber and Lyft? For yeah, I mean, season? if it was my company, for sure. Right? Scooter said the same thing earlier. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Right. And if it was up to me, I, you know, if all your employees didn't have stock, all your your capital gains from your stocks would be, be taxed as regular income. If all your employees had had. Thank you, my one person. Um, <laughs> but, you know, especially in this crowd. But, you know, <laughs> we want to keep all the money. Are we going to carry the interest? Next time? I, 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 <laughs> like rebellion. I, I, yeah, here. right. Exactly. I do agree with you. I was saying something that to some, someone in Silicon Valley, you can either start paying everyone and getting people more equal in pay, or you can pay to armor plate your Teslas. That's well, you well that's exactly right. Or, or pay everybody in cash and let them buy stock if that's what they want to do. Right. Because right. then the disparity would decline as well. But there's another piece to this now that we're on the topic that, that some other data points just to kind of make sure everybody knows it. Uh, I mentioned the 75% of venture capital going to three states. Last year in this country, over 90% of venture capital went to men, less yes, than 10% to, to women. To right Last now. year, less than 1% went to African Americans. So it's a great entrepreneurial nation. I'm proud of it. I think it's still the most innovative uh, you know, entrepreneurial country in the world. I'm proud of that. But the data does say it does matter where you live. It does matter what you look like. Kind of does matter who you know, whether if you have an idea, you have a shot. And that is not fair, but it's also stupid for us as investors. There are a lot of great entrepreneurs, a lot of great ideas that didn't necessarily go to school we went to, didn't necessarily work for the company so, we worked for. How do you open up your well, aperture and find them in different places? And, and that's what I think going to be the create some of the biggest investment returns over the next you know, right. 10, so 20 years. So at the years. risk of being extraordinarily ironic, two tall white men, can you explain to me how we're going to get diversity? I mean, I could just put my money where my mouth is, you know. Um, I invested in a woman, Arlen Hamilton, and gave her to start a million dollars. And I said, you know, don't spend more than 100K in any one place because I want you to hit as many um, um, companies as possible. And that just got started. I invested in a woman, Ravneet, who has a company, Wear Your Voice. If you go to, um, that deals with women, um, people of color, um, disadvantaged communities and just as a voice for them. If you go to markcuban.com, you'll see I have women-owned companies or women-run companies listed. But why does and probably it happen half of, still? Why doesn't it still? Because the most venture capitalists look in the rearview mirror and investing yeah. in the, you know, the people like the, like the past. And the, on the, we've got three funds at Revolution. Revolution Growth, the later stage, Revolution Ventures, and this Rise of the Rest Seed Fund. On the Rise of the Rest Seed Fund, I think now almost 40% of the investments invest in over 100 companies. Their strategy is to make initial seed investments and then kind to double down on, on winners, as you'd expect. For over, about 40% are women or people of color. Last week on our, our Rise Rest tour, I mentioned some of the cities we're in. We had five pitch competitions, 540 companies applied, you know, 40 were selected, eight per city. We, we invest in one in each city. Four of the five were women. So they're obviously out there. You just have to make an effort to reach out and go to places where most people don't go to and reach out to communities, even in those places that aren't always brought to the, the table. And it's, again, I think it's the right thing to do. It's a fair thing to do. It's a but moral thing to do. It's also a great investment. If nobody else is backing them, you know, you're, you have an unusual investment edge, uh, and I think it'll become clearer, uh, yeah. th that, that fact, over the coming years. And particularly as the demographics change in the country. Right. Right. I learned a hard lesson with the Mavericks. We went through a lot of issues that I missed, and I brought in some smart people that taught me a lot, right? And I had white guys trying to sell to, you know, Latino moms mm -hmm. Mavericks tickets. Mm -hmm. That's just dumb as fuck. <laughs> right? And, but I learned, I learned to bring in the, the population that, that I want and use them that I want to sell to. And, but they taught me more than that, right? Things that I never considered that they were aware of that were opportunities. And so it took that for me to learn. And as I'm able to demonstrate, 
by going to places that other people aren't, like you're saying, in terms of operational opportunities and sales, then it becomes obvious. Hopefully, I lift those people up. They branch off and start on their own, and then it takes off on its own. It's stubborn, though. It hasn't changed. The numbers in Silicon Valley still, for example, in Silicon Correct. Valley. Valley is not the real world. I, I know that. I get that. But it just doesn't change any, where, the, where the money is going. No one cares about Silicon Valley anymore. Good. Okay, good. So you're going to have to move, Kara. I'm going to have to move. I, to... I have. I, <laughs> I have, sir. I know. Anybody here care about Silicon Valley? Okay. Hell no. <laughs> okay, all right. Um, they like some of the IPOs that are coming. No, I, I want to be clear. I, 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 I am critical sometimes of Silicon Valley. It's awesome. It will continue to be the most innovative <laughs> ecosystem well, in the country. It, it, it really, no, I'm, I'm, I'm serious about it. And there will continue to be great investment opportunities there. But it's insane that essentially all venture capital is backing entrepreneurs just there. Right. The over 50% is in, in California. About 80% of, of that is really in what Northern about angel California. And seed? Are you aware of just in terms of numbers for angel and seeds? It's that? much broader, much more diverse. Yeah, much more diverse. I think that's so, where it comes. So get, getting to that, let's get to finish with social progress. We only have a few minutes. Um, Silicon Valley has gotten its head handed to it recently because of some of these issues around social progress, around stuff that they've been doing, around the bubble and everything else. Um, how is that going to impact things and how do you look at that now? Because it could be a force for change, like we need to move this out of this group of, you know, 17 people who seem to have messed up a few things here and there. Um, how do you look at that? Is that? How does that happen? Does it, there have to be a giant Facebook-like company somewhere else? Does it have to be a lot of companies? Um, I had someone come up to me when I was talking about more women, being invested in more women, so a, a, a venture capitalist came up to me in Silicon Valley and said, you know what, there needs to be a Marsha Zuckerberg. No. And I, I was very angry when he said that. But my issue, but the idea was, does that have to happen? Like the idea that there's something else or does it have to be just- What's happening? We just don't tell these stories. There's a company in, in Wisconsin called Epic, has 10,000 employees, started and in, in, um, essentially owned by one woman, Judy Faulkner. Uh, it's arguably the most important health IT company in the country, yeah. basically doing electronic medical records for almost every hospital. That's outside of Madison, Wisconsin, right. and it's, it's, a, it's a woman. It was harder for her to get going. As a result, she had to bootstrap it. As a result, she owns like 100% of the company and is a multi-billionaire. Mm -hmm. And so you, how do you get more of those, you know, kind of you know, tell more of those stories? It's kind of like the hidden figures thing. And how do you get more you know, women and people of color on the stage so they actually have a shot? And, and how do we collectively back them? Again, this is, I'm not making a... a fundamentally a moral case, I'm making an economic case. There, there are going to be you know, more and more examples like that. You're talking about storytelling as right. well. Mm -hmm. I mean, literally, when I say ignore Silicon Valley, yes, right? Because to Steve's point with Epic and others, they're out there. But we get so c caught up in telling their story as opposed to the rest of the country's story. Now, part of that should be the administration. They need to be celebrating entrepreneurship. They need to be out there telling those stories so that kids hear them, they get inspired, w girls hear them. You know, I tell my two girls who are not 12 and 15, you know, girls who are in STEM and math and science and business rule the world. Mm -hmm. I mean, every opportunity is there for them, but we have to start telling those stories. We, we really truly live in a storytelling country now. Everything is driven by stories. And mm -hmm. if we don't tell them, then people don't have something to connect to. All right, let's finish up by talking about what you think the most interesting areas are, in, especially around, because a lot of the stuff that's coming does have social progress elements. Right. Transportation changing could change climate change, sure. investments in climate change technology, um, investments in healthcare, investments in food, um, all kinds of, there's all kinds of stuff right. coming down the pike, robotics, automation, they're all big social questions. Right. Every one of them, it seems like every major trend coming up has, it, it's, not, it's not a dating app anymore. Of course, it's not no, a, I, think, I think that's exciting, yeah. exhilarating in a lot of ways, but also a little bit scary. And the, the way I look at this is all those different technology, AI robotics, driverless trucks, et, et cetera, uh, there's a lot of, of risk of job loss. I would say there's a certainty of, of job loss. Some things that we can't envision will create lots of jobs that we pr presently can't even imagine, but there will be some job loss. But this is not a new idea. 200 right. years ago, over 90% of us worked on farms. Mm -hmm. Now it's less than 2%. Why? Because technology made it easier to grow more food with fewer people. That's a good thing. 
Thankfully, we followed that agricultural revolution with an industrial revolution. We trained people from working on farms to working in factories, and a lot of people Where got those are jobs. Those? Because, so we because now need this to. This is happening much faster, one. And two, there, were, there was enormous social unrest. There Correct. Enormous and problems. there will be here. And it's been amplified today by social media. There doesn't by, have to be, right? I think okay. every major company, if you look at employment, obviously employment is much higher, but, mm -hmm. um, or employ, um, unemployment is much lower. Um, every major company has fewer employees yesterday than they do today and they'll have fewer tomorrow. They have to take responsibility for minimizing the disruption. Mm -hmm. Because if you're a major corporation, you're just throwing people to the street and say unemployment rate's low, go find something. You're, you're going to create more problems for yourself. I mean, look, there are going to be m new mind-numbing jobs for AI. There are going to be labelers. Right? Robotics will, will replace the mind numbiness of an Amazon warehouse, but somebody's going to have to label all that data, mm -hmm. right? Because data is the key to anything you're doing with AI. That'll be the new mind numbing jobs. But there's other jobs, all that dom domain expertise within the government labeling things. So, you know, because as we get to government as a service and there's fewer employees there in government, but more people have to be responsible for maintaining and auditing algorithms. And so name what you think the big Pick, pick one, ag tech, any of them that you think is the one that you find most interesting. If you had to pick well, I, one. I, 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 it's hard to pick one because you know, I think there's a lot of interesting things. Healthcare, one sixth of the economy, still not very convenient, still not, certainly not affordable, not even very you know, accurate. MD Anderson says that when people come there for second opinions, 25% of the time they reverse the first opinion. That's a data problem. That's an analysis problem. That's a diagnosis problem. So that's a big sector. I do think some of the use of AI, we talk about how it'll you know, eliminate jobs. We back through Rise of Rest, a company in Baltimore called Catalyte, it's using AI to identify people who have an aptitude for coding but never knew it, mm -hmm. including like a UPS truck driver. Mm -hmm. Suddenly they take this, this, go through this thing, they get put in this coding uh, program, and they get a job that's paying two or three times more. So that's a use of AI to actually give people more opportunity. So there are things like that that will be byproducts. But the, the other piece, and this was, this was news to me nine, 10 years ago, I started working on some of these things uh, in, in, uh, in DC, that as you look at job creation in this country, Essentially, all the net jobs come from startups, young, high-growth companies, which is surprising to people. Small business accounts for tons of jobs, but as a sector doesn't create new jobs. Restaurant on Main Street goes out of business, get replaced by another one, same number of jobs. Big companies, Fortune 500, some are growing like Amazon, some are declining like GE. If you add the whole sector up, it, it's not creating jobs. So you've got to be backing startups. And if you're only backing startups in a few places on the coast and not in the middle of the country, we shouldn't be surprised there are a lot of people that are kind of you know, ticked off. It's not that they feel left behind, they kind of are being left behind. Yeah. So the best way to create a more inclusive innovation economy is to back more entrepreneurs doing more interesting things uh, in, in places all across the country. And where do you, what do you think? Data freedom. Data? Freedom. Data freedom. Freedom, for instance, in healthcare, insurance companies silo their data. So you get people who go in and get a second opinion and it's different than the first. You've got um, Facebook, and we talk about Facebook and all their data. If the data was open, we don't want, it, we don't want to limit just to Facebook, mm -hmm. right? We don't want to regulate them to the position where they're the only ones that have access to it, whether it's Facebook, Google, Amazon, wherever. You want it open. Now when that becomes open, that becomes its own ecosystem, mm -hmm. right? Then anything is possible. So as the performance of processors increase and the availability of processing power is more available, if there's more openness of data. So if we force Facebook not to wall themselves off, but to open them, even if it's on a one millisecond delay or a one hour delay or one day, whatever it may be, Katie, bar the door, because then you're sitting at home and somebody who can you know, put together algorithms and do whatever, anything is possible. That's the advantage the Chinese have over yeah. us. Yeah. They take all data and they have control of all of it. You take data, well, let, faster. Let's be clear, there is a surveillance economy, but go ahead. But no, but you get the point, right? Yeah, There's, sure. I'm not talking about closing it, right? But what a lot of people are talking about regulating Amazon and Facebook, you know, when Elizabeth Warren talks about breaking them up. Yeah. You're talking about the most advanced AI technologi technologists that we have, and they're talking about, she's talking about diminishing them. When you talk about regulating Facebook and Amazon, you're talking about, you know, it, closing down their data, walling their data to just that company. That's horrific, right? We have to be talking about opening it up so it's open access. What would you do? What would, what would be your proposal? And then we got to go. Open it up. Open it up. Right. So have regulation to force them. Saying you've got to, you've got to put this into the big pot, right, of right. data. And if, if it's a government project, you know, where we're taking all this data and opening it up and making it available to everybody, now all of a sudden 
anything is possible. When you regulate them and wall it, and just they have access to it, we lose. It's over. And, and this is not, again, a new idea. It, the part of the growth of the internet most people don't pay attention to was what happened with the phone companies, with you know, Judge Green breaking them up, and then essentially requiring open access so companies like AOL actually could be part of the network. Mm -hmm. If that hadn't Great happened, points. the internet wouldn't be what, what it is yeah. today. So this idea of open data makes, makes a ton of sense. I see we're out of time. I just like the final point, just for the investors, I just want to make sure you're at least thinking about this. Personally, I think I've made two great trades in my life, and I think Rise of the Rest is the third. The first, like, like Mark, was believing in the idea of the internet when nobody did. Yep. The second was merging AOL and Time Warner at what turned out to be the peak. We'd gone from a market cap of $70 million when we went public in 1992 to $160 billion seven years uh, later, and it turned out to be a good time to do it. Betting yeah, on these entrepreneurs. On I know it didn't work yeah. out. Obviously, I'm, I'm yeah. super mad about how it worked out, but but it was it was it was the right thing to do for our shareholders. This rise of the rest. I know there's some skepticism. I'm sure people are kind of rolling their eyes. Silicon Valley is awesome, and you know that's where all the great entrepreneurs are. That's where all the great returns are going to be. It will continue that way. I'm quite confident that over the you know the coming years, this rise of the rest phenom phenomenon will take off. I would just urge you to pay attention because I think it's going to create some of the great investment opportunities around, and most people are not. Most people are just looking in the rearview mirror and are doing more of what they've done in the past, and this time it will be different. I'll tell you, there's a great entrepreneur in your neighborhood. I would find a great entrepreneur that hopefully doesn't look like you and give him a chance because it doesn't cost a lot anymore. Yeah. And with your mentorship or help, that's where, the great things ha that's where great things happen. Gosh, you almost sound like a socialist. Anyway, Mark Hell Cuban. No. <laughs> thank, you all. thank you. Thank you.